So they asked to serve as the moderator for this panel, and I thought, oh great, I get to introduce these amazing researchers, and I get to follow Josh Geltzer from the White House. Sure, let's do that. Um, but I am incredibly excited about uh, the group. So as Aaron said, uh, my name is Sam Hunter. I'm an organizational psychologist. You probably know me from the cover of the conference. I'm actually the laser face guy. <laughs> I, reckon I actually did have to model for that. I actually think they picked me because I don't have any hair and it's easier to draw, but that's okay. Um, I'll give, uh, a few other folks, as I said, I'm an organizational psychologist and the head of strategic operations here at Insight. Um, I'll be serving as moderator, and my job right now is to transition us to listening to these amazing uh, experts over here to my left. You heard about Insight's vision to be our big sky incubator. I love that. Uh, our moonshot, our Omaha skunk works. And our vision includes taking researchers from across the country, bringing them together here to be co-located. It's, it's a different energy when we're in the same room. I think it matters. We talked about that earlier, and I think you can you know, sort of feel that while we're here. And then we give folks the freedom to tackle complex problems. We have an increasingly innovative set of adversaries, and we need folks like this to the left to help us understand how to solve those problems. The panel is really a microcosm of the vision that is insight. So we take folks that have different ways of thinking, different backgrounds, um, we bring them together, we give them a chance to talk to each other, we give them a chance to talk to all of us, and then we ask them to tackle a complex, ambiguous set of issues. And so when there's a group that's this bright, uh, I'm smart enough to give them a pretty broad question and the latitude to give us some thoughts on that. So I asked them simply, what comes next with regard to terrorism in the US? And they're each gonna speak about that, that broad problem set. Structurally, what we'll do is um, I'll give a set of introductions for each of our panelists. They'll speak for around 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll open it up for Q&A at the end. Um, I also have to uh, do some introductions. I, I had a, a sight gag of, you know, opening up a sort of Santa Claus style list for each of them because it really is an incredibly long list for these researchers and thinkers. And so um, I'm not gonna do that, but I'm gonna try to summarize very quickly uh, so I can give them a, a good send off. And it, they're somewhat personal, so I'll um, lean that way instead of listing all the publications that each of them have. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Crenshaw. Uh, fortunately, uh, Dr. Crenshaw will be um, receiving a number of accolades here later in the weekend, and so I get a bit of a mulligan um, in that regard. Uh, she is a political scientist by training, currently the director of Stanford University's Mapping Militants uh, Project. Um, I think you can be pretty direct in saying, for the folks in this room, many of us study terrorism because of your work. Um, you've laid the foundation, the, the fundamental foundation for how we think about this research space and this research topic, both for researchers um, and folks in the USG as well. Again, you'll be re receiving a number of accolades and later, and so I won't list everything. Um, but I'll, I'll say this on a personal note, which is I don't read your work for what you've done. I read your work for what you're doing now. Uh, one of the things that's so great about being at Insight is you get a sneak peek at stuff. So the things that she and Dr. Malone are working on we get a, a preview of, we get to see those products as they come through and it makes me, it makes us um, a significantly better researcher. So um, the stuff is as exciting as it's ever been and I can't wait to hear your thoughts today. Round of applause for uh, Dr. Crenshaw, welcome her, thank you. Uh, next I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Seamus Hughes, uh, currently Deputy Director of the Program on Extremism, Extremism at George Washington University. Like Martha, uh, the accomplishments, the impact that Seamus has had uh, would you know, fill the room. Um, and instead, I think it's a little easier, at least for me, um, to do a checklist. And so bear with me as I walk through these things. Write a critically acclaimed book, check, be a key voice in the high impact media outlets, including the Washington Post, CNN, Fox News, BBC, PBS, 60 Minutes, check. Uh, testify before Congress, check. Work with the New York Times, check. Win a Pulitzer for working with the New York Times, check. Uh, um, work in high profile government positions, including SETC and others such as 
the FBI and the Joint Terrorism Task Force, fusion centers, check. Have extensive experience working on the Hill, including authoring key pieces of legislation, check. Win outstanding service awards and teach classes at Georgetown and George Washington University, check, check, check. <laughs> All of the checks. It's amazing uh, and an incredibly, incredibly uh, impressive bio. I'll say this on a personal note about Seamus. Um, Seamus has been an incredibly strong advocate for the center. Um, he's been supportive of us, of us in the early days. Um, and for that, as well as all the other things, I'm incredibly grateful. So round of applause for Seamus. Welcome him. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Austin Doctor, a faculty member of political science here at UNO and uh, the Director of Counterterrorism Research Initiatives here at Insight. He's a research fellow at the Modern War Institute uh, with the United States Military Academy at West Point. He's also um, a fellow at the National Strategic Research Institute as well. His work has been re recently uh, featured in high-profile news outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, War on the Rocks. He's published a number of important and key articles um, in political science and terrorism. His Twitter game is also very strong. Uh, which I joke about, um, but here's the reality is like this world moves so quickly and to have somebody that provides that kind of real time analysis um, to folks like me is incredibly helpful and beneficial. So I joke about it, but I'm always so grateful to see your, your thoughts on Twitter. So thank you for that. And a couple final thoughts about Austin before I turn it over to the panel. Um, I've had the good fortune of working with what I consider to be some of the top terrorism researchers in the world. So I've had a chance to work with the John Horgans to the Gina Leggins early in their career um, and now at the peak of their career. And Austin is cut from that same cloth. I can say that with extreme confidence. He outworks everyone in the office. I don't like to be beat to the office. I like to be the first one here and he beats me and it bothers me, but I also respect it. Um, <laughs> his field work is also incredibly understated. So Austin goes to dangerous places, talks to dangerous people and lets us then be informed by all of the um, dangerous things that he ultimately does. And he doesn't brag about that, but um, it certainly impresses all of us here at Insight. Um, he represents the very best of who the center currently is and where the center will be in the future, long be uh, beyond my time here. When we assembled this panel, uh, Aaron, Gina, and I were sitting down thinking about the names. Three names rose to the top and they stayed. And these are the three folks that we wanted out of anyone. And so I'm incredibly excited to turn it over to Dr. Crenshaw first, who will do 10 minutes, and then Seamus, and then Austin. Please welcome Austin and the rest of the panel, and then uh, Dr. Crenshaw can go ahead and begin. Thank you. Well, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I'm very flattered. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with my distinguished co-panelists and really pleased to have the inaugural in-person meeting of Insight and to be part of the consortium. So as I'm sure most of you know, a lot of my work consists of how to think about things, frameworks for how to think about things. And uh, I sort of want to go in that direction today. But let me start on a slightly different note, and that is, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the film, The Battle of Algiers quite a few. If you haven't, you should. I don't bring that up just because I wrote my PhD dissertation on the Algerian war quite a long time ago. But because if you have seen that film, you remember that there's a scene where the French paratrooper colonel is showing his officers a whiteboard with the organizational chart of the FLN, whom they're combating in the city of Algiers, who've opened up a major campaign of urban terrorism. And it's a classic pyramidal cellular structure, very closed. And what the French know is that there's got to be a person in those roles. It's very well established. They know exactly. And once they can discover who's in those slots, they can destroy the network. Now, the methods the French used were a moral stain on France and on the military and in the end, quite counterproductive. But that's not my point now, it said, I think for a long time, this was our stereotypical image of the terrorist organization. This is what it looked like. It's an old type of cellular structure. And we thought this is what we should expect to find when we look out. Now, as we know, the universe that we see ahead of us, particularly domestic extremists, violent extremists in the United States, is something quite different. I think we're all very well aware of this. We have a very shifting uh, pluralistic 
differentiated, uh, fragmented, uh, as Josh Geltzer said, unstable threat universe out there that's very difficult, very difficult to keep up with, to categorize, uh, to form some sort of analytical framework to get a grip on it. So this is sort of what I want to talk about, but I want to start also with a note of caution, which is beware of overgeneralization and sort of easy assumptions in that it'd be very easy for us to assume this is what the world is always going to look like. Our questions today have already alluded to the fact that international terrorism is still very much with us, both ISIS and Al Qaeda. And there's also a distinct possibility that the universe we see now within the United States may shift more to that sort of closed conspiratorial underground that we've not seen so much of so far. But so I think we should keep an open mind about what we're likely to see going forward. So in terms of discussing these changes from the stereotypical image, we should look at three things. One, the nature of the actors. Second, the type of violent strategies they pursue. And then third, relationships among these actors. Now, we know that the actors out there are numerous, that there are very different ideological strains that often uh, overlap, are syncretic, and that they combine ever, ever, obviously strands that are often extremely contradictory. You can't see how could someone have a belief system that has all these contradictory elements to it, but as we know, people can hold very contradictory beliefs and be quite content with that sort of contradiction. Uh, not everybody is a natural scientist and perfectly logical about their beliefs. So we know that groups are very different from each other. We know that ideologies do matter, both to the type of group and the type of organization, type of violence, type of relationships. So I think sort of, in a way, maybe one point that we should remember that I think has already been raised today, because I think we've already started with a really stimulating discussion is that ideology does matter. You can't lump them all together as the far right extremists, which, the media, with all due respect, often tends to do as a form of shorthand, uh, that it's important to understand all these very, very different uh, branches. And what we see then is often uh, the organization of groups being extremely fluid, uh, very difficult to establish boundaries between groups. Uh, recruitment follows often very different patterns than in the past, uh, not such careful vetting as you would have seen with very closed underground uh, conspiracies. Uh, these are often very open organizations, not closed. Uh, they're often quite ephemeral. They seem to, you know, they happen, we read about them, they have a name and then they disappear very quickly. Uh, they can be extremely transitory uh, and not very uh, enduring. Uh, it's often difficult to know who the leaders are. And even in the groups that tend to be more centrally organized, such as the militia and paramilitary type groups, Oath Keepers, for example, uh, are still very decentralized and depend a lot on their local chapters, as opposed to a top centralized leadership. So a lot of fragmentation in the nature uh, of the group itself. And as I say, I think one of the most important points is the porousness of boundaries among these sorts of groups. I've read some studies that said we shouldn't even refer to them as organizations or groups, but simply as entities, just entities out there floating around. Now, accordingly, the forms of violence that we see go far beyond what we've typically thought of as terrorism. And I don't want to get into the debate now over what is terrorism and what is not. So let me just say I'm talking about uh, the kinds of strikes perpetrated by the FLN, by ISIS, by Al Qaeda. So what we see now is certainly the potential for this, certainly some of this, I think some of the accelerationist violence, uh, the white supremacist violence is closer to this than some others. But what we also see mixed in, in actually a very confusing way, is uh, essentially street fighting, very public manifestations of violence, brawling, what other accounts of such behavior have called thuggish behavior, uh, something designed to be quite public, quite open, and the perpetrators make no effort, really, very little effort to conceal their identity. <laughs> Indeed, they proudly display symbols, 
clothing, other insignia to identify themselves as a representative of uh, often a particular group. So very, very different constellation of violence with classical terrorism being only one part of it, a great deal of uh, display posturing and an overlapping of sort of violent protest and terrorism muddled together. We had thought of the classical conspiracies sometimes as being offshoots of failed protest movements uh, in the 70s, uh, even in the 80s. Uh, now what we see is a real intermingling, the use of protest and the use of more violent techniques. In the research project we have, we always tried to identify what was the first act of violence of a given group. And with these new groups or entities, we found it very difficult to identify when was actually their first use of violence. And we've started at least when they were brought up on charges in terms of a court and accused of the use of violence, because otherwise it became very difficult to even to pinpoint when the turn to violence really began to occur. In terms of relationships or interactions among the groups, uh, here uh, I was recently reading about uh, the Nobel Prize in physics, and it was for proton physics, and they talked about entanglement among neutrons and such. I'm not a physicist, obviously. But I thought, this is what these groups are. They're entangled. We don't see formal alliances. We don't see formally declared rivalries and feuds, as we might have seen where groups were more determinative, we might say. But they often coordinate. They act in concert, but without necessarily any kind of central direction. So they are connected in terms of memberships, because often they're shared memberships. You don't have to belong to just one. You can belong to more than one. They're not exclusive. They attend the same protests, answer the same appeals via the internet, attend training camps together on certain occasions. And here we see somewhat of the transnational dimension. I think we're still seeing a weak transnational dimension in the violent far right. But I think obviously we're concerned that this could be strengthened. The questions about Ukraine were quite pertinent. This is a the kind of opportunity. So that brings me to the issue of why, why these changes in the threat environment. And I look to the social movement literature with which a lot of you are, of course, very familiar threats and opportunities. The threat. It was back in the 1980s that the far right popularized the concept of leaderless resistance. Why? Because they knew that if the FBI knew their organizational chart, just like the French paratroopers, they could put people in it. And if you have that kind of strict closed conspiracy, you often only need one thread for the whole thing to unravel. And so not only the far right, jihadist groups, others came up with the idea of much less organization. Interestingly, uh, a form of security being less organization. And essentially, these groups are abandoning control over violence for greater security, which is an interesting, I think, thought and way of looking about it. So they have, in effect, forfeited a lot of the aspects that were regarded as advantages because it does bring greater security. Then look at the opportunity side. And I would say two types of opportunity here. One, the technological side, social media, online communication permits these forms of informal organizing, uh, communications, contacts. You can belong to a group by simply following their thread, uh, by following the same social media channels, by communicating with people via encrypted channels. It's very easy. But the second form of opportunity is, of course, the one that Josh Geltzer mentioned, which is the normalization of violence and extreme rhetoric in the American political system. Uh, calls to violence, apocalyptic rhetoric, all this, I think, conveys an air and sometimes a reality of social approval, which can be very important to the mobilization to violence. Both of these opportunities are extremely difficult to deal with. And I don't, I don't underestimate the challenges that are facing all of us. And in conclusion, I'll just offer a couple of thoughts. I think that individual level deterrence does work. I think it does work. Uh, I think that it's led to a substitution effect as some of these groups have moved 
to participation in politics. Uh, perhaps equally dangerous to democracy, but there has been a shift. Uh, and second, I actually don't think that our older CVE prevention methods are very useful in this particular context. So on that note, I'm going to end my talk and turn it over to my distinguished colleague, Seamus Hughes. Thank you. Um, I don't normally get nervous talking, but following Martha makes me very nervous. I doubt it. If I'm being honest. Put me in a room with the senator, no problem. Put me in a room with Martha and I get very nervous. Um, and after 10 minutes, you see a, a thousand PhD dissertations bloom off of just that talk. Um, so thanks, Gina, for putting me in this position. Um, I also want to thank everyone for, for coming here. It's, it's an honor to be at Insight. Um, you know, when I came three or four years ago, when it was just like a twinkle in the eye of, of Gina uh, on this, um, I jumped on board because she was such a true believer in this mission. Um, and there was no other partner we wanted to work with than um, Insight. So it's a real honor to see what was, you know, boxes of pizzas and ideas on the back of a napkin to 150 people in a room. Um, so, um, so the question was, you know, where are we going on terrorism in the next five years? Um, not to be too flippant, um, but the answer I think is everything, right? Uh, and by that I mean, if you look at, if I steal a little bit um, of others' works and model it just a little bit, we're basically, we've seen in the past basically modern um, mini waves of terrorism, right? The 70s, we had far left extremism, 80s and, and 90s, a rise of the far right, 2000s, uh, jihadism, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and now a, a bit of a resurgence, not even a bit, a resurgence of far right extremism in this country. Um, I would argue, though, uh, that in the next five years, we're going to get a fractured threat, what my colleague Devorah Margolin and I talk about, a fractured threat. Uh, and by that, I mean it's going to be everything, unfortunately so. And I'll dive into each area and explain why I think that is, uh, and then we can go from there. If you look at, at domestic terrorism in this country, three years ago, the FBI director talked about some 800 active investigations in all 50 states. When he testified a few months ago, that number was 2,700, right? So a huge rise in the number of cases. Now, some of that is the outlier of January 6th, which they categorized as domestic terrorism. But if you take out those 800 plus folks who have been arrested, you're still talking about a 40, 50% 50 increase in domestic terrorism cases in this country. It's also an interesting dynamic when you look at domestic terrorism, or at least particularly far-right extremism, because it reminds me a lot of 2002, 2003 timeframe of jihadism in America. Think of Revolution Muslim handing out pamphlets at Times Square. You had kind of group dynamics there. And then the FBI did their thing, rolled up a bunch of folks, uh, and then now you've kind of moved in jihadism to be one or two individuals, not an organized group. On domestic terrorism front right now, we still have those organized groups. Right? We have the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys, and the Oath Keepers are obviously under some uh, level of pressure. Uh, the Proud Boys moved back to a, a state model and are, are going pretty well in, um, from their perspective on these type of things. At the same time, we still have individuals that are acting uh, and committing attacks. You look at the, the, for lack of a better word, successful attacks in this country, the Buffaloes, they weren't tied to organized groups, right? And law enforcement, from their perspective, understands groups, right? You can put your guys on a cork board, run the, the yarn, and figure out the, the dynamics and the leadership structure of that. And so they're inherently drawn to taking down these groups. Because they think to yourself, these guys are, are more likely to commit attacks, they're organized, they're trained, things like that. But for the most part, we haven't seen that bear out in the last few years. Uh, it has been individualized, uh, or individuals who have committed the most attacks. Now, you could argue that's because the FBI has put pressure on groups. I would argue, though, um, when we talk about pure violence, uh, we are dealing, with the most part, on individuals. It's a different question than societal ills, which I'll get to in a second. Um, we've also seen, as the, as the Office of Director of National Intelligence talks about a transnational nature of domestic terrorism, to be fair, there's always been a transnational nature, right? Guys have always gone to Australia for you know, white supremacist rock concerts or, or London for my London folks, right? Um, but there is clearly a trading information. I mean, the Buffalo Manifesto was a copy and paste from an attack in New Zealand. So they're learning at the very least um, if they're also not trading. At the same time, and Josh touched on this a little bit, um, Mr. Geltzer talked a little bit, we have got a, on the international terrorism front, it hasn't gone away, 
The FBI, again, has talked about 1,000 active investigations in all 50 states. That was 1,000 active investigations at the height of ISIS when they held territory the size of the UK. It's still 1,000 active investigations right now. In fact, uh, I'm increasingly hearing from FBI agents around the country that they've seen a resurgence in the number of cases they're having to deal with in the last six months. Uh, we'll try to figure out why that is, but they're saying that the system's blinking a little bit more red than it had in the past. So we can't take our eye off of the ball of that. Uh, a smaller issue, but what, one that is rising, is far-left extremism, which again, we've had these waves in, in the 1970s. For the most part, we haven't seen far-left extremism transition to violence towards people, but it's not a hard logical leap from throwing a Molotov cocktail at a Port Hill and federal courthouse to committing an act of violence. We have seen that in the past, although we haven't seen it yet. We also have seen a number of, of vandalisms and attacks towards um, pregnancy centers post Dobbs decision. Uh, Again, I don't want to equate it with the number of cases for far extremism, which far exceeds, but it's something to consider. And the last set of folks we need to look at is what law enforcement colloquially calls the Joker effect. These are individuals who just want to watch the world burn. Right? They don't fall into a bucket of ideologies. They're trying to rack up the score as much as humanly possible. That becomes a harder uh, issue to deal with. And I would argue that our US government and, and our academics and our think tanks and all that, we're not structured to deal with this fractured nature of the threat right now. In the domestic terrorism context, we don't have these similar charges that we have on international terrorism. So individuals will be charged with guns or drug charges, uh, which have second and third order effects, which is when you throw a guy in jail for a gun charge, but he's really a white supremacist, nobody really tells the Bureau of Prisons what's going on. And more importantly, when they get out of prison, probation officers don't know to check when they do a no-knock check that they're looking for guns when they should be looking for Nazi flags. Uh, and so there are second and third order ramifications when we have this two-tier system when it comes to domestic terrorism. We have a rising number of threats by any measure. We have a rising number of, of active investigations of the FBI and a pretty solid, uh, stable number of agents for the last five years. Um, our resources haven't kept up. Uh, there is um, a, and our, our politics don't allow for a level of bipartisanship that we used to have. When I was a congressional staffer, um, politics stopped at the water's edge for national security. That is not true anymore. And so it becomes harder when you're trying to plus up your resources for assistant U.S. attorneys and, um, and FBI agents. Increasingly, too, we've seen a polarization uh, online, particularly, and a inability to get through our own echo chambers. Uh, and so if you're interested in one form of media, you then, the algorithm then recommends you keep going down the rabbit hole. Before you know it, you're supporting QAnon and talking about stopping elites from drinking the blood of children. It's not actually that far of a hard logical leap, uh, the way the system is set up. And the targeting has been more confusing, too. You know, think about four years ago, you would have never thought um, that uh, hospital workers and medical officials would be a target, uh, but we saw that during the pandemic. Three years ago, uh, you would have not thought it would be a profile and courage to be an election official in this country. And it clearly is, uh, as the work that, that Pete Simi is doing to look at, at threats against um, those individuals. So the targeting has changed. If we're talking about hardening, it's not just bases, it's not just um, public spaces, it's, it's also individuals, right? And the noise gets so loud that we, we can't really figure out when the, it's just yelling or when it's getting to a point where we actually should deal with it. This fractured nature makes law enforcement's job a lot harder, and it also makes academics' jobs a lot harder. Because you can't, as, as I teed up for Josh, is you can't bucket your systems that you used to. You know, in the old days, you had the FBI agents who, you know, focus on international terrorism, and they would know exactly what um, the nuances were for their propaganda. If you're an expert in uh, in that, and your case agent, or your, I'm sorry, your, your your individual you're looking at, floats between ideologies, right? They take a little bit of of ISIS, a little bit of white supremacist, a little bit of incel. You now got to train your agents and your analysts to know that Stacy's and Chad's is a key word for incels. At the same time, you gotta train, train them to know who Anwar Laki is. Um, you have to basically train your, your, your workforce to cover all forms of extremism uh, and not necessarily specialize in any of them. 
we don't have a system to deal with that right now. We've got international teams, we've got domestic teams. We've got government agencies that focus just on domestic, others that focus on international, and there's a floating of ideologies in a way that makes things quite difficult. Finally, well, two more things and I'll be done, which is, um, you know, I was wrong. Um, and that I mean, if you asked me five years ago, I would tell you that internet radicalization was not a true thing. Meaning that, of course, people are online because the average age of a ISIS recruit is 28, the average age of a white supremacist is something like 30. Of course, they're online. They're also breathing. It doesn't really tell you much from a data point. And I would argue that you probably needed to have a connection in the offline space to be able to commit violence. I think the last two years have proven that theory to be wrong. Um, and maybe that's a reflection of how we've gone the online space. But our structures to deal with that, similar to our structures to the US government, is not equipped to deal with that either. And the GIF CT is great, but it only focuses on four major um, internet providers and social media platforms, where our guys that we're most worried about are playing on platforms that do not sit at the table at the White House. Uh, and so that fractured nature makes that things much different, difficult. One last thing to note is I would also argue that as terrorism researchers, we may need to shift to be extremism researchers. Now that is going to be difficult because extremism by its very nature is more amorphous than terrorism. Um, but for the terrorism part, we're talking about legal ills, right? Being able to arrest somebody for crossing a legal threshold. We're increasingly seeing, as, as Martha noticed, or noted, um, societal ills, right? Where extremism basically percolates its way through our political system and our systems of government so that it becomes not as clear cut as it was before, and so that you're not really focusing on those 50 guys you're worried about. It's much more pervasive in nature. Now that's gonna make our jobs a lot harder, because the more you move down that spectrum, the more likely you are to hit against uh, the political nature of that research. And trying to get yourself to rise above that fray is going to be very, very difficult. But I think it's probably where we're gonna have to end. And let me turn it over to Austin. Okay, mic check. Uh, good morning, everyone, and a good early afternoon to our colleagues and partners tuning in from the East Coast. Uh, as Sam mentioned in his kind and generous introduction, my name is Austin Doctor. I serve as the Director of Counterterrorism Research Initiatives here at Insight. I'm also an Assistant Professor of Political Science at UNO, so that's the disciplinary lens that I bring to, to bear on this work and on uh, the way that I make sense uh, of the world. I specialize in militants. Uh, terrorism and emerging threats. Let me begin just by saying what uh, a pleasure it is to join Gina uh, and Sam and welcoming you all here to Omaha. And then I think uh, obviously what a privilege it is to, to join uh, my two panelists for this event this morning. You know, for a kid that grew up off of a, a dirt road four hours that direction, um, it's, it, it's, it's special. To, to see this community of, uh, of leading scholars and of expert practitioners brought here to the Great Plains and all focused on our common mission, our shared vision, right? And that is to make uh, America and Americans safe from violent terrorist threats. And so we, we look at the world uh, and we've been discussing this as a, as a panel um, and, and the terrorism landscape in particular. And we, we see that violent extremists of various stripes have uh, abundant and even growing and expanding means at their disposal to create harm and disruption. I, I think we can say that this is manifesting in a number of ways uh, to include uh, malign use of emerging technologies uh, and, and an expanding attack surface, that is to say a growing range of viable and vulnerable targets. And, and perhaps first and foremost um, is the vulnerability of American critical infrastructure. And so. In my brief time today, I, I want to speak a little bit and share some of the ways that Insight's working to identify and understand uh, emerging and emergent threats uh, to American critical infrastructure. This is just part of that broader story that we are working to uncover. Uh, like any story, and I will not lecture on other components of a story while sitting next to an award-winning journalist, but we know that there's a what, uh, there's a who, and there's a how, right? And in this case, um, what are the nature, what is the nature of the threat to critical infrastructure? Who's responsible for that threat? Who's perpetrating that? And how are they doing that? And so that's where we're headed, that story, uh, for the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, let's start with the what. 
uh, terrorist attacks on critical infrastructure uh, has taken a, a front row seat. And we know that that critical infrastructure represents the, the services, uh, the goods, the sectors um, that really serve as the backbone of our national security and resilience, uh, whether it be agriculture here in our backyard, information, technology, government facilities, um, or, or energy. Uh, attacks against these spaces can manifest, as, a, as, as was already mentioned, a, a cyber attack on a local hospital or an attempted IED on a busy metro station, right? Um, but we recognize that ground truth, that this matters. Um, as, uh, as recently as June of this year, DHS has emerged or identified uh, emerging threats against critical infrastructure as a strategic level risk to the United States. And this isn't just from hostile nation states, it's not just from foreign based criminal actors, it's from domestic violent extremists, it's from homegrown violent extremists. It's a problem sourced and located with origins and roots here at home. Uh, a joint report produced by our friends and colleagues at the Program on Extremism and by Insight speaks to recent trends in extremist attacks against that critical infrastructure, um, drawing on a sample of, of nearly 100 different violent extremist cases um, that were charged in either planned or, or actualized and attempted attacks over the past six years. Uh, the, the report finds that 40% uh, of those attacks targeted critical infrastructure directly. Uh, and looking under the hood there at those, uh, that 40%, um, it, four sectors emerged uh, prominently. That is uh, energy, transportation, government facilities, um, and commercial areas, um, suggesting that four out of 16, 25% of critical infrastructure sectors are really bearing a significant brunt, right, or, or load of violent extremist activity in the United States uh, today. Okay, so let's go to the, that second part of the story, the who. Who are these violent uh, extremists? Uh, the same report uh, revealed that this isn't just the work of, of one violent extremist um, industry, one overly radical uh, or an active uh, radicalized cell, um, but that it reflects activity by a diverse and geographically dispersed set of violent extremists, uh, namely uh, Salafi jihadists, homegrown violent extremists, and racially and ethnically motivated domestic violent extremists. Now, what's interesting here is that the attacks um, perpetrated by these actors against critical infrastructure uh, seems to reflect two distinct underlying logics, that is, two distinct strategic purposes. Uh, the first points to, that first pathway points to a more focused and even like terminal focus on maximizing harm, creating mass casualties. And this is affiliated and associated predominantly with those Salafi jihadists who are aiming to commit acts of terror for the purpose of creating harm and psychological trauma against mass populations. And so as a result, right, based off that logic, they're drawn to those critical infrastructure uh, structure sectors and sites that tend to bring in a larger number of civilians. So we're talking government facilities, we're talking commercial areas uh, and mass transportation. That second pathway, and this is more associated with those RIMV actors, domestic violent extremists, uh, points to a logic of disruption and chaos. Um, particularly for those RIMV, maybe I should say specifically, for those RIMV actors that have adopted that accelerationist operational profile or strategic posture, uh, they view critical infrastructure attacks as that first necessary step, right, to then destabilizing society as a whole in order to then promote and establish a new envisioned ideologically sourced um, social order and hierarchy. And so unlike their Salafi jihadist counterparts, Rimbis envision these acts of terror really as the initial lighting of the fuse, just the beginning stage of that broader process uh, and, and a sequence of activity. The uh, bottom line here is that critical infrastructure uh, certainly uh, remains an operational point of focus for multiple key segments of today's violent extremist ecosystem. Okay, um, so now on to the third part of our story, the, the how. Uh, what factors, uh, as it relates to emerging threats, what, what factors or, um, or, are facilitating or enabling these threats to our critical infrastructure? Uh, and at Insight, we're working to better understand how terrorists are going to use uh, emerging technologies new platforms and TTPs, tactics, techniques, procedures, right, to attack critical infrastructure targets in creative and harmful ways. Um, there are three projects that I really want to tee up. You'll learn some more about uh, over the course of this conference, but that I, I want to highlight here that uh, 
fall with this, within this line of effort and that I'm, I'm especially excited about. Um, the first speaks to emerging threats against critical infrastructure and the question of terrorist use of explosives. Uh, the problem here is that IEDs have demonstrated that these tactical level tools, right, can have and bear strategic level effects when they're used by or applied by skilled users. Um, over the past decade, uh, terrorists and, and violent extremists have continued to innovate in the way that they use explosives and conduct attacks both against critical infrastructure and more broadly um, soft targets. And, and this comes despite significant investment in the counter IED mission and mission community, right? This threat has remained resilient, uh, stubborn, and has evolved. And so by way of supporting a solution, Insight will be partnering, we just launched this project this week, um, uh, we'll be partnering with DHS Science and Technology Directorate, the CISA Office for Bombing Prevention, uh, to develop a formal assessment uh, of where the greatest research-related needs are uh, in combating terrorist use of explosives today. And with that pointed focus of better understanding and identifying where is innovation happening, uh, both on the IED, the malevolent side, and on, on the white hat side, where has innovation happened over the past 10 years uh, in, in countering IEDs, and where can we target research products over the next decade to mitigate and support that counter effort? Uh, a second project that I'm excited about relates to emerging threats um, pertaining to geospatial technologies. So I've already heard some of this mentioned uh, by some of our researchers today, and so we'll have to see. Um, uh, but the problem here is that open source geospatial tech uh, is expanding rapidly. Um, this isn't all bad, right? This is uh, meant to be a productive resource, but the problem is uh, that like a lot of new tech, it can also be exploited by terrorists and violent extremists to either conduct or support uh, their operations and attacks. And I think particularly when we're talking about geospatial uh, data, data-enabled technologies, that critical infrastructure would, is, is likely a target and, and is at risk whether it be open source geospatial data, low cost geospatial programming and management, and these all create lower barrier, uh, barriers for entry uh, and open up new doors for malign exploitation. Uh, I think about uh, the rise in precision uh, farming technology. I know George Grispos is here in the room with us doing really amazing work on this space here uh, at UNO. Uh, the use of drones for mapping and ISR, both as uh, data generators and as, as users. Um, uh, the internet of things and accessible increasingly accessible satellite imagery. Uh, and so in response to this perceived and anticipated threat and looking over the horizon, uh, we'll be initiating a, a project uh, uh, on this theme in partnership with DHS s &T to provide an updated and forward-looking threat assessment based off of the changing and rapidly evolving and expanding geospatial tech environment. Uh, and then finally, I'm excited about our growing research portfolio on the metaverse. Uh, we've been looking downrange, Sam uh, and I, uh, and our mutual colleague, Joel Elson, who works innovation and technology and leads those efforts at Insight, um, um, have been working together to assess and forecast how violent extremists may exploit these platforms to affect uh, Americans' daily lives in negative uh, ways. And in fact, we've already seen criminal activity on multiple metaverse uh, platforms. And so we believe the US-based violent extremists uh, may exploit, um, uh, may, may use the metaverse for a number of threat amplifying purposes, uh, some of which will also have direct and significant implications for critical infrastructure. Thinking about digital twins, for example, and the roles that those can play in things like communication, coordinating, and operational planning. Uh, the expansion as the metaverse develops and, and follows its uh, trajectory, the expansion of actually vulnerable targets for the metaverse itself may come to host and represent a, a form of critical infrastructure. Uh, this work on the metaverse, I think, reflects also and encapsulates so much of who we are at Insight and what we're doing in this shop um, here in Omaha uh, and through our consortium and that we're, we are focused on a daily basis uh, on producing actionable evidence-based solutions to complex problems. And we have the commitment and full understanding that in order to do that, uh, it requires interdisciplinary and inter-industry collaboration to see that through. Um, Sam is an organizational psychologist. Joel is, uh, works in information science and technology. I am the political science jabroni on the team. Uh, we're combining those insights, right, to unpack how the metaverse can be used today and in the future to undermine American security and resilience. Um, I see I am out of time, so to conclude, uh, Insight is investing in efforts to understand better how terrorists and violent extremists present emerging threats to critical infrastructure. Uh, we are funding that through our consortium. We're doing that work here 
in Omaha. Um, new techniques, platforms, emerging technologies can give these actors, these violent extremists here at home uh, who already harbor and cultivate ill intent, right? fresh capabilities and fresh opportunities to disrupt and harm our critical infrastructure and soft targets. And so I'm grateful that so many members of our consortium, so many members of our team are actively working to better understand this problem set, to develop actionable solutions and to support the Homeland Security and CT workforce in mitigating these threats. Thanks. Thank you, amazing, awesome panel. Um, we're gonna do a quick Q&A, and I'm going to, as moderator, steal the first question, um, and then we'll open it up and have some mics, I think, that are floating. Okay, good, we're getting set up. Um, so I wanna pull on a couple threads that were sort of hanging out there a, a bit. Um, Martha, you talked about um, just sort of the changing nature of the different groups and organizations. Uh, Seamus talked about uh, fractured threats, Austin talked about sort of emerging tactics and uh, approaches as far as the threat landscape goes. So the very simple and easy question is, how do we remain or increase our adaptability, our nimbleness? And again, I, I think each of you touched on some solutions, but I, I would like to codify those given the nature of the audience. Um, it'd be good for, I think, all of us to hear, both as researchers as well as members of the USG. So um, we'll start with you, Martha, and, and move down to Seamus, and we'll open it up for other questions. Well, that's of course always the hard question. Right. How do you then solve these problems that we've all identified? Uh, it's always a hard task for academics because we'd rather diagnose problems probably than explain them than find answers to them, honestly. But uh, I took to heart what Seamus said about uh, resources uh, for government in pursuing these sorts of cases and the very uh, multifaceted nature of the threat stretches our resources so thin uh, that FBI, uh, DOJ, National Security Division, other agencies that deal with the domestic threat, uh, the authorities are different. They are very restrictive, uh, as we've noted, and there's simply, you, you're going to need more resources, but you can see all the political dangers of trying to accrue more resources for counterterrorism. They're very real dangers. They'd be dangerous even if we weren't in such a polarized political climate. And now there's a real fear of a, I would say, almost a backlash against, say, the FBI and, and courts, uh, officials of all sorts. And I noted that I thought individual deterrence worked, the fact that you actually are gonna be hauled into court and convicted of a crime and spend some time in jail. For people who are not deep, deep, deep believers and willing to make that sacrifice, that the deterrent works, but that requires resources to bring people uh, to court and to in effect apply the legal authorities that we have. Uh, how to do this without gaining more political support for the mission uh, I think is really is is uh, a very hard task ahead of whatever administration is in power. Oh, that's for just a quick couple of points from uh, the two of you, so we can have more questions. So, how do you have thoughts? Um, very tactical one. I, I would set up fusion fusion cells uh, at DHS, FBI, and DOJ for cross ideologies. So, um, you know, there's. And, the, and then the longer one, um, and this is, I'm biased, but insight, right? I mean, the fact that there's, there's people in this room that cover all ideologies, all tactics, um, the US government should be leaning on these folks um, very heavily um, because the, the knowledge is there. It's just a question of getting it out um, for it. Sure, yeah, um, in some ways repeating uh, Seamus's final point there and that I think uh, flexibility, uh, it, interdisciplinary work is a force function for encouraging um, flexibility and then it forces us to step outside of our hard set mental models and think about uh, not just creative solutions but to think about problem sets in new ways. Um, uh, I think recently, uh, Program on Extremism and Insight produced a report on, for example, the Black Hebrew Israelite movement, and thinking, well, that's a category within the RIMV category, or within the RIMV designation, and that's thinking outside a little bit of the box of how it's often discussed as a top line uh, item. Perfect. Great. Thanks. Um, we'll do one question, and I know it's in between us and lunch, so um, does anybody have a question? I think let's get Rick in the back if we can. Clara? And if folks have to duck out, because I know 
again, I stand between you and eating, so. Hi, Martha, you really dropped, ended your <laughs> presentation with a great bombshell of, and I don't think the prevention uh, tools, techniques, programs that we have now are gonna be applicable to uh, this, this increase in anti-government, domestic types of uh, terrorism. Uh, uh, to the extent that a lot of these programs are at an individual level and dependent upon understanding and interrupting cognitive and behavioral processes, uh, can you give us a little bit more of your insight on, on why you think these things won't work? I think uh, the answer, and uh, thank you, Rick, for the question, is, uh, is very related to the social approval uh, issue that I brought up, that in a situation where there is widespread approval for extreme rhetoric and sometimes the use of violence, it's very difficult to say to someone, think about this in a different way, think of alternative solutions when, when everything around them in their environment is pushing them differently. So it's, a, it's an uphill battle. So I would say you'd have to pursue the individual cognitive level at the same time as pursuing a wider societal level. And I think one reason some prevention programs might have worked uh, against jihadist terrorism was that local Muslim communities totally disapproved of this. There was no, really no community support, except in very isolated instances. So that I think that that facilitated the task, and I think that's why it's going to be much more difficult now. Perfect. Thank you. With that, we're out of time, so let's make sure we give a round of applause again to this panel.